This is the presentation for the paper Introducing the Gamer Information Control Framework Enabling Access to Digital Games for People with Visual Impairment, authored by Ronnie Andrade, Melissa Rogerson, Jenny Waycott, Stephen Baker and Frank Viteri from the University of Melbourne. My name's Melissa Rogerson and I will be presenting the paper on behalf of my co-authors. With an estimated 2.5 billion video gamers around the world, gaming is well established as a social and cultural phenomenon. But the visual nature of digital games, embodied literally in the name video games, renders them mostly inaccessible to people with visual impairment. In this paper, we propose a framework for understanding the elements that enable people with visual impairment to access digital games. Unlike previous research on games for people with visual impairment, we've not focused on a single game. Rather, we've worked together with people with visual impairment to identify the key elements that enable access to digital games. This fosters a rhetoric of empowerment and recognises the unique skills that people with visual impairment develop through their lived experience. I'll start by looking at what types of game people with visual impairment access. Audio games provide complete auditory interfaces so that they can be played without the use of graphics or with minimalist graphics as you can see here in a short clip from the audio game Swamp. On the other hand, text-based adventures are games that provide information and are controlled through text. These provide an accessible option despite not being specifically designed for people with visual impairment. The elements found in digital games afford a specific range of in-game actions, for example jump, pick up item, open door, etc. Signifiers such as a door handle, enemy icons, compass arrows or a bag communicate potential behaviours to users. Although it can be tempting to leverage metaphors from the real world, we must remember that there are risks in adopting overly literal metaphors. Moreover, there's no agreement or convention on what these signifiers actually represent. For the research presented in this paper, we conducted a series of in-depth interviews with a group of expert gamers with visual impairment. We had a group of six expert gamers from different parts of the world, most of them blind. We used thematic analysis to analyse the interview data. Our previous work described the play habits and practices of gamers with visual impairment. In this paper though we focus on the relationships that enable gamers to access digital games and I'll present some of the themes identified in our analysis with some relevant quotes from participants. First, participants highlighted that people with visual impairment conceptualise 3D space differently from sighted individuals. This has also been found in literature on orientation and mobility. Participants also highlighted that so-called 3D games that are targeted to people with visual impairment let players move in a grid-like pattern, as we saw in the clip from the game Swamp. In our participants' words, in the blind community, when we say 3D games, it means that you can walk up and down the map, unlike side-scrolling games, where you only walk to the sides. Participants also described metaphors that were based on real-world objects. These included radar, white canes and footsteps, and all of these were used to aid gamers with orientation. Apart from the use of objects, Games for people with visual impairment also used metaphors of real-world phenomena, for example 3D binaural recordings. However, according to one of our participants, although they enjoyed these recordings, if you try to use the same effect in games, they fall into the uncanny valley. Another phenomenon that our participants described was echolocation, or the ability to use sound and echo reverberations to form a mental image of physical space. Participants noted that different games implement the metaphor of echoes to convey different actions, and they also recognised the computational complexity of echolocation. Our participants also pointed to a complex interplay between hardware and software when engaging with digital games. One participant described the use of Skype to mediate in-game communications, and another mentioned the interplay between the screen reading software and digital games. A third described specific hardware devices that interface with certain games to provide features such as head tracking. 
Participants also talked about the importance of text as a gaming interface. They described their interaction with MUDS, which is summed up in the quote here from our participant Carlos. If you want replayability and to explore multiple facets of a story, then a text game is usually the better option. MUDS also draw a lot more on your imagination because it's just text. However, not all participants enjoy MUDS. Some cited the need to memorise a number of commands or just having to type commands as something that they prefer to avoid. Another important aspect of the gaming experience that our participants identified and which we'd not anticipated is their role as creators. One of our participants pointed out that the community tries to create their own games and said that he's provided voice acting for some games. Another participant described how they, for a time, tried to create 3D binaural recordings. And finally, another participant talked about BGT, a programming language used specifically for the creation of audio games. He noted that current industry standard tools are not accessible and are only used by sighted game designers. This highlights the need for more accessible creation tools. We used thematic analysis to analyse the interview data. And when we reflected on the themes that we'd identified, we realised that participants had focused on a small set of key relationships that enabled them to engage with digital games in the first place. And it's these relationships that we've condensed into the gamer information control model that's shown on this slide. Many of the themes that we identified referred specifically to the player's relationship with information that was being conveyed in game and with elements that allowed them to control the gaming experience. Our analysis showed that information about virtual space is key for access in digital games and that objects and phenomena are regularly used to convey information, for example objects like doors and signifiers like footsteps or echoes that I described earlier. But we also found that relationships of control were key. These could be internal for example when a player uses text commands to interface with a digital game, or external when a player interacts with the game through for example a screen reading tool or through communication software. And importantly these relationships appear where the gamers engage with the games as players or as creators. In the field of orientation and mobility, literature supports the idea that people with visual impairment conceptualise spatial information differently. This highlights how important it is that we provide meaningful metaphors to convey spatial information. These metaphors need to recognise the unique skill sets developed through the lived experience of people with visual impairment and may include a variety of ways of presenting information, such as text or echolocation. The second element to be considered when conveying information is in-game objects and navigational tools. These may be embodied, they may carry and convey metaphors and affordances from the physical world, but designers need to be mindful of potential problems from overly literal metaphors. Moving on to relationships of control, we argue that relationships with external controls like screen reading software should be carefully thought out. As our paper explains, many participants like to have their screen reader always on and are therefore reluctant to engage with games that force them to relinquish that control. Our participants mostly mediated control within the game through familiar peripherals such as keyboards, but obviously there's a possibility here for designers to use non-conventional input mechanisms for control, including for example head tracking devices, which might be used to indicate the direction of a player's gaze or movement. Participants shared several instances where they'd engaged with games as creators, providing voice acting, trying to produce binaural recordings, or even delving into programming languages and tools. Our paper argues that gamers' lived experiences with disability must be seen as a strength, rather than as something that needs to be normalised, and that the work of gamers with visual impairment enhances the gaming experience through their understanding of these dimensions. Finally, by presenting the Gamer Information Framework, we aim to encourage the design of games and game creation tools that are more accessible through the consideration of the elements outlined in this framework. This will encourage the development of experiences that are empowering 
and equitably accessible for people with visual impairment. Thanks for your attention. The full paper is of course available in the ACM Digital Library.